Cammy Patton, a casting director for As We See It, which follows three young adults who are on the spectrum. Uh, I know Jason Kadams, who adapted the show based on the Israeli series, wanted it to be neurodiverse in front of and behind the camera. And he's said that he immediately called you after he got the green light for the pilot. So what was that conversation like? Uh, well, pretty amazing. I mean, we, we have a few things in common in our personal lives. And uh, uh, so he knew it was something that would be near and dear to me. And the idea that he had already gotten the studio to okay us really just focusing in the beginning on looking for neurodiverse talent was huge. So we had four weeks and uh, just really blanketed everything we could. And it was, it was probably my favorite job I've had in my entire career. Not probably, it was. It was overwhelmingly gratifying from day one. Mm -hmm. So what was that casting process like four weeks? Is that, it's, that sounds pretty fast, but I, I, I don't know how if that's just like normal for you know normally normally you'll have 10 weeks to cast a pilot and it usually the the major roles sort of start to be evident in the first few weeks you kind of you know get to that pretty quickly of who and then there may be surprises along the way but um in this process uh we were just concentrating on the three leads and we it was slightly different because normally you would reach out put out a breakdown all the agents would start pitching very few agents had you know actors that were going to be right for us here they, they may have had clients who had children that might be right you know adult children whatever um, but we also put it out on actors access so people could directly submit we did a lot of research um, looking into theaters all over the country and Canada and uh, even in the UK and um, audition because my son is part of a theater. And so it just had us thinking, OK, there's going to be a web of of theaters out there that have talent that's untapped. And what was I think the most different about this process is that each theater we would reach out to would would tell us about two or three more like did have you tried this place have you talked to these people and would give us the you know the contact information and it was really just the most incredibly collaborative and supportive group of people excited to even just be considered you know to have their their um uh team members you know considered so it it i it just snowballed and we what, when we really were just hopeful that we would have a few very good candidates, we tested 10 actors for the three leads. We flew them in from Canada. We flew them from upstate New York, Pennsylvania, um, uh, just all over and had this big mix and match day of incredible people. So it was, uh, I don't, it was eye-opening really. And, yeah, and it sounds fantastic. amazing because you are searching for talent, obviously living on the spectrum and it's it's an underseen and underserved uh, group of actors um, and, and, you know, people represented like on in media um, and also especially as young adult characters because I think oftentimes when you see characters who are autistic, it's usually young children, right? Yeah. And yeah. they're also not the lead of a TV show or a movie. Uh, so what, what did it mean to be able to discover all these amazing actors on the spectrum, like you were well, saying? All part, of what was, <laughs> yeah, part of what was interesting about it is that these are people who, many of whom have never been encouraged to try to follow mm -hmm. this, you know, and yet um, for a lot of people who are on the spectrum, it is a great, uh, it, it's, it's a, a really good um, what do we want to say, tool for them in terms of going to class, being on stage, trying to be outside of themselves. And so they're, they, they are there, they do have experience, but they've not been encouraged to actually follow it professionally in a lot of ways. And I think one of the things that I think I appreciate the most about this project is it is showing people with talent, you know, go for it. They're, they're, there is a way forward. And we we were able to use some of the people that we tested and some of the people that we found along that audition process in other roles, both neurodiverse and neurotypical on the show. Um, 
And that, that as well was like, it wasn't like, okay, now we've checked those boxes. We've got our leads. Let's go. We, Jason was so um, really committed from the get-go to doing this in the most inclusive way. And we, we were kind of allowed the freedom to do that. And if we had to fly someone in or bring someone in from out of town and put them up in a hotel, there, even to be an extra, there was no question asked. It was just done. And, uh, and it was the first time I've been as involved in hiring even the background actors because every extra that you see in an environment, like in the, in the drama class, and they, everyone there identifies as on the spectrum. Um, so, you know, it was just... I don't know. It was it was incredibly um, rewarding at the end of that process to be able to, you know, include people that m- otherwise would not have been included at that point. You know. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the three leads you cast are Rick Glassman, uh, Sue Ann Kian, and Albert Rutecki. So how did you guys land on the three of them, and and what made them the right ones for uh, Jack, Vivian, and Harrison? Well, interestingly enough, uh, Sue Ann and Rick came in on day two. Uh, They both were uh, represented. Rick had only recently, only a couple of years before, actually uh, gotten his diagnosis and said that for the first time, his life made sense to him. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he was a working actor uh, prior to that. Uh, Sue Ann had started in modeling and had done some jobs and was represented. Um, So the people that you know, that were represented by agents were in that first wave of people we saw as we were taking the time to reach out to other, uh, you know, more remote areas and getting people to self tape and whatnot. That took a little bit longer to get those in. Um, But from that day, it was such a relief to see how talented (laughs) these people were. I mean, they just came in and and owned their parts from the very first day. And we had people that gave them a run for their money. But in my mind, the bar was set from the minute they both auditioned for those roles. Similarly, um, Albert self-taped in Pennsylvania. And uh, my daughter at the time was my casting assistant and she saw his tape first and came flying in the office going, you have to see this, you have to see this. And it was just so Harrison. It was just, you know, he, it just, there was just no question. So it, we did have people that we mixed and matched. We put different groups together when we were testing that could have gone very different ways, but there was just something about that chemistry between the three of them that just really felt so right for those roles, particularly. Uh, and it just, I, I, I really don't know how, normally that process is so stressful and you're just, you know, plowing through trying to cover as much ground as you can and make sure you've found the right people for every role. And this was the opposite. It was joy every day. <laughs> I just don't know. They, how they to really do feel like they've they've known each other for like decades and they've been living together for a while. <laughs> you <laughs> really do. Yeah. Well but and you know we did is, like, oh, sorry. they're also all three of them are like really good at comedy too. Um and that's such an important element of the show because they're you're laughing like, with them, like not at their expense. And I feel like a lot of times when autism is like portrayed in media, there is like a, a seriousness to it or like a heavy handedness. And I thought like the comedy that they bring to it was so important. So was that something you guys were keying in on too? Absolutely. And there's always that element in what Jason writes. And, um, you know, he, he kind of effortlessly goes back and forth between poignant and dramatic and funny and just real life. And uh, that part of part of what was interesting about that is they did actually really click even from the day we did the tests where they just felt like they were roommates, that they already knew each other. And we then shot that pilot and it was over a year because of COVID before they all came back and we could do the series. And from the very first Zoom table read, <laughs> which you know felt so awkward, but immediately, not just the three leads uh, who are on the spectrum, but our other cast members as well, they're just a family. And you could feel it immediately the way they were you know, catching up with each other and asking, they really had gotten to know each other in the course of that pilot. And there's a comfort level between them that is really hard to fake. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they just, it, it's, it was one of the um, kindest and loveliest sets 
ever, which again comes from Jason. He's, he's a, an incredibly warm person. It kind of always starts at the top and he sets a tone, but you never know when you bring a group of strangers together, what that dynamic is going to be. And the dynamic from day one of this group was so supportive. When we sat together on the pilot for the first time to do a table read, everyone was crying <laughs> and laughing and, you know, just overwhelmed discovering each other in their roles. And yeah, I, it's, it's hard to not be as effusive as possible about it. It just <laughs> no, was no, this is what such a for. different kind of experience. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that, that sounds awesome. Um, and like, I, I'd be remiss not to mention their support system, uh, the, the actors who play their sports, uh, Sozie Bacon, uh, Chris Pang, and Joe Montaigne, who also has a, a daughter uh, on the spectrum in real life. Um, so can you talk quickly about casting them? Because they, like you were saying, they fit so perfectly into that world too, as well. It, it's really interesting that when I was reading, I had read for a while for Sozie's role and, uh, and people were very good, but there was, I, I wasn't quite able to put my finger on what it was that was missing, you know, as this person who's supposed to be uh, their guide, you know, and, and helping keep them focused and all of that. It, it, there always was this sort of distance between the actor reading that part and the people that they were talking to. And Sosi naturally is such a loving person. She can't, not be and it just comes through so her approach to that character then was someone who saw them as peers and and in no way was trying to either talk down to them or tell them what they should be doing but just trying to be that person guiding them and reminding them and you know of, of what their goals were and it came from such a genuine and loving place that you instantly understood why she would choose to be there um, and it just made all the difference and and similarly with Chris Pang he self-taped from Australia in a vacuum <laughs> you know not having any idea who his sister who was playing his sister and that role the challenge of that role is that this is someone who is having to be the parent for their sibling and be responsible for their sibling and is also trying to have his own life and um, it's a lot of responsibility and you feel it, you know, you, and you know that it's coming from his concern for her. There are also times where it's overwhelming and it's very hard to not come across, um, the, when the frustration comes out, it, it was, it's easy for that to come out as, as just real frustration and not coming from a loving place. And once again, he did it. And you could just feel from the get-go how much he loved his sister. He just was not equipped to handle this responsibility and it was beautiful and you know it, it just you sometimes you don't know until you see it what actually makes something work and that was sort of how it was with both Sosie and Chris the minute you looked at those auditions it was like okay now we have it <laughs> if that makes sense yeah for sure uh well cameo is great speaking with you thanks so much Thank for your you. time and we'll see you back here in a little bit my pleasure Sky Topic, casting director for The Challenge. You've been working with Buna Murray for 14 years. So from your end, what has it been like watching the franchise evolve over the years? And really, I think now it's more popular than ever. <laughs> I mean, just when I thought it couldn't get more popular, it gets more popular. I mean, you've got these committed fans who've been watching since, you know, Real World One and have been watching the show since then. And yeah, now it's, you know, pulling in, you know, such a unique landscape because it's casting from outside franchises across the global TV landscape. So, you know, it's including Big Brother, Survivor, Amazing Race, Love Island, like Warsaw Shore. So the result is that audiences can see contestants change over so many years and it adds, you know, that depth that you often don't see in like reality TV in the same way that I believe you see on our show. Mm -hmm, for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when it was just uh, Road Rules All-Stars <laughs> back in the 90s. <laughs> they were good seasons. They were, I mean, yeah. I mean, it was just like real world Road Rules, but I understand like the, the need to expand beyond that. Um, and uh, the, the most recent season, Spies, Lies, and Allies, I'm just going to read all the shows you guys pulled from. Yeah. The real world. 
Are You the One, Big Brother, X on the Beach, Survivor, Love Island, Geordie Shore, War Shore, Paradise Hotel, Shipwreck, The Circle, Too Hot to Handle, uh, Ultimate Beastmasters, and 12 Dates of Christmas. And these are also domestic and international versions of these shows. <laughs> uh, how overwhelming does that make your job when you know you can just literally pull from any reality show around the world? I mean, it is so overwhelming because you know you're not only trying to cast within the framework of the vets that you know have such a um you know the audience and the fans love so you really have to reach out to those names that are going to be able to onboard these new rookies from the other shows you know if English is their second language do we have someone there who can help them navigate the politics of the game so it is a ginormous job, um, especially at the beginning when we're trying to look at like what shows we can pull from. Um, but it's it makes it you know really exciting. It is a giant jigsaw because, like I said, you don't want to just throw someone in the house who really like doesn't have anyone to help, any vet to sort of help them navigate that beginning of the game, which is obviously you know the very difficult part of the game when they're trying to find their feet. Mm -hmm. So uh, how many of these shows do you watch? <laughs> um, I, w I try to watch most of the, I mean, certainly the ones in English, um, you know, I watch the ones that I don't have the same kind of access to. Uh, I watch like little, you know, pieces of them that I can find. I mean, we do long casting interviews with um, cast. And if I'm unsure about someone, I will go back and re-interview them. Sometimes not even necessarily to show everyone I just like will suddenly wake up and be like wait does Gabo know how to navigate this house is his English strong enough do I feel like he has it and I'll kind of go back and do a quick re-interview and you know obviously you know he made the cast and he was great but you know do, can he do that you know and then you know the cast members like Nam for example you know he did it he had a tough time on his first season and we really felt like he deserved like that second go um on Spies Lies and Allies. Mm -hmm. Well, for these uh, seasonal themes, uh, I guess, what, what is the process? Do you, are, you, are you told of the theme and then you're just casting for the theme or do you sometimes um, you, you just have people like on the back burner that you've seen previously, but were not cast and you might think like, oh, that's like, they, they might make sense for this particular season or you, you make suggestions um... like maybe we could do like this type of theme. Right. Everything is happening simultaneously in a way, like the games team will be starting to work out the games, what formats. Sometimes I might be casting for a, a couple of different format ideas that I feel like, you know, we may be working on. But yes, obviously the format really um, tells me who we want to cast. Um, and sometimes if, you know, the format doesn't work, we'll have to put someone who you know, is a great name, you know, on the shelf for a season and, um, you know, revisit them. So yes, the format definitely dictates the casting, but, you know, if there is an amazing name that we really feel like we need, there's is an often way to sort of bring them into the mix. Mm -hmm. uh, well, like you were saying before, you know, sometimes you bring people back, you have a lot of recurring personalities and, so they have their own, I guess, continuing storylines over different seasons. Uh, so how do you keep that in mind when you're also casting, but maybe that person doesn't make sense for this season right now, you know? So we, like you said, like put them on the back burner for now. <laughs> right, right. I mean, the challenge is, you know, it's a, it's a cinematic world. It's very like the Marvel universe. We need to rotate our villains, our heroes, our underdogs from season to season. And obviously that does begin with casting. Um, if I know that there is a story that feels unfinished from the previous season and I, and I feel like the audience really needs to see that, um, you know, like settle, I definitely want to lean into that. That's not something I'm going to jump away from. Um, and then, you know, sometimes, like I said, a big name that may have been on multiple seasons, um, you know, like a Wes, you know, we may want to just put, you know, uh, off a season so that there's an excited return, you know, like a Durrell or a Teresa, so that there's, um, you know, some sort of excitement about seeing those really big name vets come back into the franchise. Yeah, sometimes you need to take a break. From yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> they need a break. It is, I mean, it's really, 
a very uh, taxing experience. I mean, ultimately that cross that finish line and they're like, this is the best game in the world, but it takes a long time for them before they're even standing in front of TJ, you know, getting through the casting process is, is a massive effort. And um, it is, it is really intense for our cast and they do an amazing job. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I mean, I, I know that reality shows also have alternates on standby in case someone falls out for whatever reason, especially, you know, during COVID, if someone has positive, right. they, they, they're out. So um, what is your process for, uh, I guess, casting alternates and determining uh, who to bring in as a replacement if such a case arises? Right. So basically, like my initial outreach is normal. Our initial outreach is normally like 300. Then that sort of whittles down over the casting interview batches. And uh, we sort of get to about sort of 65 names we feel happy with. And there's a lot of different versions within those names of who will work. So, you know, if you're going to lose a cast member, you may end up losing three because a lot of the storylines that you may have been thinking that would be pivoted off that person won't happen because they're not there. So the alt, the alt situation, I normally have about 10 people sort of, and you know, that's also in a little bit like in a movement as well, um, just standing by. We won't fly that many names out to the location. We'll fly maybe four um, names just in case something happens from, you know, departure to, you know, standing in front of TJ. Um, and they will sort of stand by in case we need to pull them into the game. Mm -hmm. You know, but I have had to call, you know, obviously we didn't have to do this for Spies, Eyes and Allies, but I have had to call people in the past who are just sitting at home and be like, okay, <laughs> you need to get on a plane now. <laughs> and see, they're like tomorrow, frantically yeah. packing, they frantically pack their bags and they frantically unpack their bags in disappointment and then they're repacking. I mean, I imagine a lot of people just have a go bag ready in case they get the call from you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. well they do. And then they kind of like, oh, I'm unpacking Sky. I'm like, I know I'm not gonna make it. I'm like, just hold onto that bag. And then, <laughs> and then they do. So I always uh, tell the alts like, you know, better to, better to be uh, in it. You never know. Mm -hmm. um, well, lastly, do you have a, theme that the show hasn't done yet that you you would like to see done in the future I know you've said like no no that's no, no like there all that so Even many fans want it <laughs> great themes I mean I would love to see um you know a vet rookie season again like um you know obviously we explored that in battle of um uh, the champions, you know, uh, the season that CT and Ashley won. Um, but I think that would be a great uh, one to revisit. You know, I mean, it wasn't an amazing season, Bloodlines, but I, I feel like, you know, exploring that family aspects of things is really fun, friends, you know. So I'd love to see that where like rookies are sort of onboarded with a vet, you know, that the audience knows and may root for because of that. And I always think that's a really fun thing. Awesome. Well, fingers crossed. Uh, Sky, it was great speaking with you. Thanks for your time. And we'll see you back here in a little bit. Thank you so much. Thank you. Marty Simpkin, you were already the casting director on Star Trek Discovery. So was it just a no brainer for you to also do Strange New Worlds? Well, I mean, it, Strange New World is a spinoff of uh, people that uh, my partner, Orly Sidowitz and I cast uh, in Discovery, um, they liked those cast members enough to decide to build a show around them. So it would have been a real bummer if we didn't get to do it, but. <laughs> That's true though, because it's like, you, you guys did a great job. People responded to these characters or the people you cast as these characters as well, because uh, some of them, you know, they're already established that fans know. Um, so like, let's go back to that before that casting, because it's, uh, if I was Pike, Spock and number one, played by Anson Mount, Ethan Peck and Rebecca Romain, uh, introduced on Discovery. So what do you remember about casting them in those roles? Well, Anson was somebody that uh, we brought in for Lorca in the first season. Um, uh, Orly's a huge fan of his from Hell on Wheels. She's a sucker for long hair and a beard. And, uh, so we had brought him in for Lorca and he wasn't really right. He was really too young for that role, but he did something that uh, sort of uh, previewed and became the 
proof of uh, concept for us when we cast the rest of the show during COVID. Uh, Anson was in New York um, and we, he put himself on tape at his kitchen table in his little New York apartment. And he was such an incredible sport about it. And it was so charming that he had done it because he was an established guy who had done, you know, the lead in a series. So he, he's the kind of person that you would think doesn't have to read, doesn't have to self tape. And he did it with such grace and charm that even though he was wrong for Lorca, we of course remembered him. And then when the Pike opportunity came, uh, Jeffrey Hunter was the original Pike who was a classically handsome gray haired guy. So we pretty immediately thought about Anson and yet people wanted to retape him. And we thought, oh no, we have to ask him to tape again. And he was in another kitchen and uh, put himself on tape again. And that spirit of sportsmanship, um, you know, really sort of permeated you know, everything that we did. I mean, the Spock situation, we were still live then and uh, saw many, many, many people for that role and no one was quite right. And we couldn't tell people what they were auditioning for. So no one knew they were Spock. They didn't know they were a Vulcan. I mean, it was, that was one of the more bizarre and challenging things we've had to do on Star Trek. And that says a lot, um, but he was just, there was, yeah. there was sort of a hundred people and there was Ethan and he was spectacular. And he was great, yeah. Totally. He was great. Well, that, that just makes me think like, were you guys secretive about the casting for Strange New Worlds and some of these characters who are younger versions of established characters and or some are relatives of established characters? So what was like the casting breakdown for these roles? Well, we had fake names. We had fake names upon fake names. Nobody could remember the fake names. I mean, we had a chart with the fake names and the real names for our, our showrunners because nobody could remember <laughs> what was what and what not to say to the actors when we were Zooming with them because for, yes, for a long time, we had to keep everything secret and people were so fantastic about not, you know, blowing it. Um, you know, the secret thing is because the, the fan base for Star Trek is of course, very, very, present and uh, you know looking for every crumb of everything and writing about everything. So the breakdowns are very vague. Mm -hmm. um, well, before we start, we were chatting about how COVID allowed you guys to uh, get more self tapes or and expand your, your search or broaden your search from all over the world and in casting these roles. So um, can you talk about like finding some of these actors who, uh, you know, not, not, you know, super well-known like Christina Chong and like Jess Bush and Celia Rose Gooding, who's a young Uhura, who I think is really great in the role. And just, she's so like aspirational. <laughs> this she cadet. is. She, uh, yeah. Well, I, I mean, what was great for us about COVID and, and I'm sure some of my colleagues have different feelings about this, but um, as, as I just said with Anson, we, we had done the self-tape to great acclaim. We never, Anson never came in in person. Um, and in fact, we, Orly and I just met the cast at the premiere of Strange New World. We met none of the actors. We had met none of the actors in person until the premiere, um, which uh, was was really wonderful to, to see them in person, but it was very exciting for us to be able to do all this stuff virtually because we could open the search really widely really widely past uh, the traditional agencies that you usually reach out to, you know, do some of the stuff um, in this range that Cami was talking about um, and, and really um, just bring in people from all over. And what's happened in the past is that when we knew Jess for a long time, for a couple of years, we brought her in for things and she always would get to the finals and then people would want to meet her, but she wasn't really established. So flying her in from Australia seemed a stretch for them and daunting on those shows. And what was great about COVID is everybody knew they couldn't fly anybody in. So they were willing to accept and cast people. I mean, we did audition them in person. We did get on Zoom, thank you very much Zoom, for uh, with 
you know, the showrunners, with everybody that would have been in the room. But I think because everybody had been Zooming so much for the writing and with their families, that people came to really know and understand um, that you can make a connection uh, in this medium. It's a bit awkward, it's a bit weird, you have to adjust to it, but it's doable. And I think the fact that we have a great cast that works wonderfully with each other is, is a proof of that. Mm -hmm, for sure. I also feel like maybe now because of COVID, like people are more used to just uh, connecting it's via Zoom, like virtually. Absolutely. Like, you, you have, people have like happy hour Zooms. So, yeah. Yeah. So they get, they get that it's, you know, before the idea was horrifying. No, we have to meet everybody in person. And then as, as you said, you're used to meeting your family and your friends. And, and I think we've all learned, you know, it's still a little odd looking up at the camera and not looking at you and, you know, all those other odd things that you have to get into the habit of doing, but, um, you know, the actors were adaptable and and being able to adapt to that, by the way, is good proof that they'll be able to adapt to all the strange things they're asked to do on the show. You know, they have to work on an AR wall. They have to work, you know, with green screen. They have to work with weird aliens that aren't going to be there and all of that. And it's, you know, you have to be game to be in this mm -hmm. cast, really game. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, the show, I think it's already in production on season two, right? We're there. pretty close. We we just had the read through yesterday of uh, 208. So we're almost done. Oh, you're almost done. Wow. Yeah. Um, and it's going to introduce Paul Wesley as Captain Kirk. Uh, so mm -hmm. can you talk about casting him in such an iconic role? <laughs> you know, stress, a lot of stress, a lot of stress, because you knew everybody was, um, you know, going to be judging. Um, I don't know if you've seen, there's a sort of hilarious photo that he he sent out uh, oh, yeah, yeah. while he was keeping it quiet because you know nobody could know that he was doing it before it was announced. Um, he got on an airplane and ended up sitting next to randomly William Shatner. And he did a selfie with Shatner who was, I think thought he was just some rabid fan, weird fan like, and that was pretty. It was, that was, it was meant to be, so. Totally meant to be, yeah. totally meant to be. But it, it, you know, it's it's challenging. You know, you have to think about what um, you know. We're excited about him, and we think the fans will be too. Mm -hmm. uh, that he has the charm and the um, you know the stuff you're looking for for that character, and to sort of recreate. You know, what what I'm really proud of for the cast doing those roles is that they've, you know, they honor it. We honor it, but recreate it. Yeah, and it's also they make it their own a little bit. Like yes, and you absolutely. can tell like they eventually grow into the the older characters that we know. So right. Um, well, Marty, it was great speaking with you. Thanks so much for your time, and we'll see you back in a little bit. Okay. Aisha Bywathers, casting director for We Are Lady Parts. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your BAFTA win a couple of weeks ago for the show. Uh, uh, amazing speech. Everyone go watch the speech online. But um, I love what you said in it because uh, you said sometimes you're you're one of one on the job. And this time I was one of many and immense so much. And could you just expand on what you meant by that uh, working on this show? Yeah, I mean, um, it was such a special experience working on this show. It was um, a chance to work with lots of people, lots of women who um, also came from similar backgrounds to me, um, a people of, of colour who've had similar sort of um, experiences growing up in the UK. So it, it just felt like a really nice experience. You know, you don't have to explain all the time everything you're doing and why you're doing it and why it sort of feels important or authentic and why you want to make work that people can watch and feel seen. Mm -hmm. I think the show does that itself. Um, it, it follows the, the Muslim, Muslim woman in a punk band and a lot of the stuff goes on set and I feel like maybe on another show, maybe told through like a white lens, they'll feel the pressure to explain um, certain things like, you know, how, how they practice like each 
um, religion uh, or their religion. Uh, so, I, and I know you've worked with Anita Manzur before, the creator. So what, got, what did you guys like discuss when you were first starting to cast the show? I mean, in, in terms of, we just discussed the girls and what they were like. I suppose it's exactly that. It, it's not really delved into in the scripts. So we didn't need to, as long as we felt that those girls were authentic then that that was how we'd move forward. Um, you know, there's different challenges. So one of the cast wears a niqab the whole time. So you only see her eyes, the character Momtaz, played by Lu Lucy Shorthouse. So that's an interesting audition process in itself because obviously you, you didn't start the process like that. And actually most of the process, she wasn't wearing a niqab but you just knew that she could, until, you know, those final recalls, but you just knew that she could emote in a way that would really work. But that's something that I've not seen before. I would speak about how wonderful it was to see, you know, the idea of someone wearing that and then sort of like smoking an e-cigarette you know, like <laughs> through it and what that will look like. It, it, it's just things that you haven't seen, which obviously, will happen <laughs> yeah for sure. and again it's something else that that goes like unexplained but you just you get it when you watch it you know um so so what was it like casting all these ladies um who are in a band like did you look for people who were able to play any instrument or had any like musical ability was that uh number one or like a priority when when you're looking for uh who to cast for these parts so that was it really, it was about having a, a musical ability. So in the first um, audition that we had, um, what we asked people to do, it was to tape actually, and we gave them a scene, but we also gave them a piece of, we gave them a song. And we asked them if they would sing and dance and rock out to this song. Because what we wanted to see is, you know, how comfortable they were doing that um that would tell us who could or couldn't sort of be in the band and then throughout the process they actually met with the musical director of the show to just see their musical ability not all of them um could play before we started obviously in a way we were sort of you know given a weird gift by covid because over that period everyone could at home alone harness <laughs> that music they, they ability. <laughs> exactly but that's all that's all it was it's just who can play and who do we think can learn to play and there was actually one of the roles played um Bisma played by Faith was recast um due to a, a scheduling issue after we started filming again after COVID and for the people auditioning for that role, we had to send guitars to their houses to have that part of the audition <laughs> um, over Zoom with the musical director. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess it's also like you, if, if they weren't able to play, it's like teaching them after their cast to, to be able to play believably. Right, so that's something- that, That's it, like yeah. all Nida wanted was that it didn't great as someone who can play an instrument you're not watching them and thinking they're faking it mm -hmm. and you know they're not doing a great job so it was really important you know always always with this job it just needed to feel authentic it always came back to sort of that and that world because this is the first time we were going to see this sort of idea of Muslim girls loving punk and being in this punk band in the UK it felt so novel it needed to feel right Mm -hmm. I mean, you also hear about, you know, actors lying about like their, their skill. So <laughs> <laughs> what was there someone like you really wanted and like they lied about playing uh, an instrument or, or, you know, having any musical ability? If, if you lied, because the first step was you sort of taping and putting yourself out there, it was found out very quickly because <laughs> it is something that if you can't do well, yeah. it just doesn't come across comfortably. I think the main thing that was, it, it was less about that and more actually about forming of this band. So one of the parts of the process is that we all, it, it, there was actually quite a lot of people that we recalled to the final stage and then we got them in in different iterations because it was all about who are these women? Who is this band? 
And they so there are some amazing <laughs> people. Yeah, yes, yeah. so there are some amazing people who unfortunately didn't get roles just because they didn't fit. It didn't make sense in this band, in this show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think like the the alchemy for this group is it's it's great because I think they're so distinct and like you have like Anjana and like Sarah especially as as Sarah I think she's such such a striking character because she someone who is just focused on Lady Part's success and she's kind of like emotionally unavailable too and it just it works in in the group. Um, but one thing I also um, loved about it is like the the comedic aspect too because I think. Oftentimes, um, when you see Muslim women like portrayed on screen, it's it's uh, you know maybe like they're portrayed as victims or like it's very serious. But like it's uh, this is a comedy. Like there's very a lot of comedic elements to it. So was that something you guys kept in mind as well, uh, auditioning? Completely. Um, I think especially with Angela, a lot of it comes. I think through her that voiceover character. too. Yeah. <laughs> There's a scene in it where she just walks <laughs> and I can't handle it. I find it to be the funniest walk I've ever seen. That physical comment, you know, everything that she's doing. Um, because, yeah, Sarah is so serious. So it's a different form of, of comedy, but completely. It was really important that that sort of shone through. So <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It, it was really hard. <laughs> it was a really hard job. Because with the comedy and the instruments and being true to, to these women and who they are, the pool's really small. Um, so at points it felt like, are we going to find this? But we kept on going and going and going. And, you know, they were there and it's, it's amazing. And we're happy to have given them the opportunity. I mean, what, what does it mean for you to be able to give these actors, uh, many of whom I assume have been uh, working for a while, this opportunity to lead a hit show like this I mean from my regard it feels such an amazing thing to have been able to do just because obviously in in my job there's lots of times where you give people straight out of drama school or or young people who you find these opportunities at the beginning of their career but these are jobbing actors who I've met before so to give them these distinct and defined roles and to just say guys they're here please cast them, they're amazing, they're versatile. Um, it, 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 feels, it feels great. It feels great to have found that ensemble. And it feels great that they all get a chance to shine. Mm-hmm, for sure. Um, and lastly, is there anything you can tell us about season two? Are, are you casting that as well? I can tell you that I'm excited about season two. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but in terms of the casting challenges it holds, I, I, I'm yet to, to find out any more. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll just wait for it then. So, uh, well, Aisha, <laughs> it was great speaking with you. Thanks so much for your time. And we'll see you back in a little bit. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Libby Goldstein and Junie Larry Johnson, casting directors for Yellow Jackets, a show that lots of people are obsessed with. And one aspect people can't get over is how well cast the show is between the young and older versions of the four main ladies. And I guess, how does it feel for fans to respond to your work this way in such like effusive praise for, you know, this, wow. Like some people think like, you know it's like one person playing these roles sometimes we've heard that (laughs) yeah we have heard that particularly with uh, the christina ricci role yeah and sammy yeah yeah they really anyway you know it's been fun it's really you know it's always fun to be part of a show that that resonates with some i don't know if it resonates but people jumped in on this and especially a certain age group, I think. So I think more than anything, we feel really good about the but producers, Louie and I, everybody feel really good about what we did, but it's also just fun. You never know how anything's gonna turn out. And uh, it turned out really well. Mm-hmm. Libby, do you have anything to add or? <laughs> just gonna let her answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, <laughs> what she said. <laughs> Well, but um, but in that one thing Libby has said, uh, Libby will get going in a minute. But um, <laughs> when we were when we were casting these two different age, everyone says, you know, how'd you do it, and who'd you cast first, and you know, I will say, our, when we started, we knew it was important that they everybody 
have, but we weren't that they, you know, looked like the younger ones look like the older ones, but we weren't trying to cast lookalikes. And even um, at the very, the final result of it is so much better than I think even any of us thought. We knew there were similarities. We knew there was, they uh, had the same feel. Like I think um, Melanie Linsky and Sophie Nalise, Melanie Linsky always says Melanie Linsky was the first person we cast. Sophie Nalise was the last person we cast, like in the whole show. And that pairing couldn't have been better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. So what was like those discussions like with uh, between you guys and the creators, Ashley Lyle and Bart Nickerson and um, the director, uh, Karen, uh, Karen uh, uh, for the, the pilot, like just finding, like you said, Melanie was cast first <laughs> and Sophie was last. And I, I, I mean, I guess you guys, you know, you said like you weren't focused on the physicality or, or the, the look alikeness, but were there times where you just, you know, had to like hold up like headshots to see like how oh, yeah. close they look? I think, I think my, if my memory serves me, um, there were a couple of people towards the end when we were having trouble, were talking about hair, makeup and wardrobe and that, you know, we could fudge it that way because we really wanted to get the best actors as well we lucked out really that we have the best actors and they embody both the old and, and the young. But I think it was really important, really important for them to embody these young girls, the older actresses, because the audience is smart and you just can't put someone in a wig and you know dress them up and say, that's, that's her because it shows up so much in the show. It, it goes back and forth so much. I just don't think you can cheat the audience. So it, we got lucky and it was really, really important that you believed that that's who they were. Mm -hmm. um, was there uh, an instance where you cast the, the teenage version before the adult version? Oh, yeah, wow. there was. Yeah, you know what? Yeah. Well, first off, um, we cast Jasmine Savoy Brown. Yeah, before we did. Before we did um, Tawny. Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of were a little bit at the same time, but we saw all the parts at the same time, all the actresses. We didn't start with one and then try to match it up. Because we, when we start, you try to get, first off, the people that interest you the most, period, for each of these parts. And then... You, you do the mix and match. You, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you cast both like parts of the dual roles, did you have like the, both, both actresses in the same room ever? No. no, never, never. And this was right pre COVID. So we did do casting in the room with the producers, which is probably almost the second to last show we did that on. And yeah. it was really fun. And I said, but you know, a lot of actors weren't in town. Like Sophie Nelise was on tape. Um, a lot of people. A lot of people were on tape, you know, and you just, from, from being in Canada or New York or out of town or wherever, especially the, especially the young girls. The first time I mean, everyone saw each other was at the read throw. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, yeah, COVID, I guess. <laughs> Sophie Thatcher was, uh, yeah. I remember she read for a couple of parts, which I actually didn't even re remember until Libby and I were going back and looking at our notes, because when she put herself on tape for uh, the young Juliet Lewis part, she was just perfect. But Juliet Lewis was cast pretty late too. Yeah. Wasn't she? Mm -hmm. she was always in our mind, but, um, and Sammy Hanratty read for several parts, I believe. Yeah, she read for everything. <laughs> She was a great and, 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 and was a when, when did you realize she was like the right Misty? Oh my gosh. Couldn't be better. <laughs> she's yeah. she's so good, people think it's Christina Ricci's. I know, they, I know. Okay. Someone in our office, their boyfriend thinks it's <laughs> they he thought the whole time it was the same person. <laughs> that just blows my mind. So yeah. Uh, I mean, that's just a testament to how. A great of a job you guys did then so and I will say when they all went to Canada which is the first time they had all really met each other and this was during COVID and I think they had rehearsals and everything because you know the older they're never the, the young and the old are never in the scene at the same time right 
but they did, I think that they did, um, they helped each other out just at the table reads and knowing it, you know, just with their aura. And also the writers wrote these characters such that the, the younger and the older versions of them had a really strong through line of who they were. Yeah, they I mean, I guess this out. is more of a, a question for the actors, but the, the performances in both timelines for all four of them feel very in sync. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's part, part of that's, I mean, large part of that is what the, the writers did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, was there anyone uh, you guys saw that the two of you disagreed on for uh, like any reason? Oh, wow. <laughs> we never disagree. <laughs> I'm kidding. That's why you work together so well. I mean, but actually on this, uh, I think we were pretty in. So, yeah. yeah, I'm looking at my little cheat sheet and uh, it was pretty clear. We saw some really great actors. Yeah, and we saw some that yeah that didn't get the part because they just didn't fit the, right. the group. But uh, and I think it was one thing for us is really fun seeing the younger people because there was just so much talent in these young kids and they were young. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Was there anyone that you guys were really pushing for that you saw like uh, yeah, yeah. Sophie yeah. Elise. Sophie Nelise. We were the, the last one. She got yeah. cast like really late. There was a visa problem. You know, that's how late it was. And uh, which I just found out about. And I didn't even know there was one. And that uh, we were really pushing for that hard. And you know, it's, not, it's not like pushing against our cre the creative team, but just, they're just, it has to go through a lot. It has to go through, you know, a lot of network studio just a lot of pushing to do to get the deal to get the anyway yeah I mean, not everybody a, a saw us. not everybody yeah. saw that not everyone saw her at, uh as a, the right fit mm -hmm. and part of that was because they didn't think i have to say part of it was a few people didn't think she looked enough like melanie which when now they, they had to dye her hair right yeah, yeah. yeah. that did yeah yeah but I just think they're so she perfect. She embodies her so well. Yeah. That sure. um, you know, we weren't looking, like Junie said, for lookalikes. We were just looking for the same souls, really. Mm -hmm. Um, well, lastly, uh, season two um underway, uh, or or I guess they're they're writing it now, but um obviously now fans are invested and they all have their takes on who you guys should cast for certain adult characters um, in season two. And um, I guess like where you are, where are you guys in the process and you guys take those, uh, you know, fan suggestions into account um, during, during this casting process? Well, first off, we haven't started yet. So mm -hmm. uh, they're writing and we are gonna start, I think in a couple of weeks. Um, I think, I don't think we take it into account, but after we're kind of into it and looking at, I think we may, we probably look online and look at it or are the younger kids in our office do, but uh, I don't think there's, well, I haven't looked at them, so I don't even know who they're suggesting it. Do you, Liv? No. We you, don't, you, don't, you don't want to be influenced by them. <laughs> oh, no, no, and we well, started. You know, they might, you know, they might have a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're not opposed to it. We just haven't really, we don't really know that much. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't started. So until we, you know, hear what the producers are looking, you know, what the writers are saying and what they want and what their vision is for what's happening with these characters. We gotta, we gotta find out a lot of stuff before we uh, speak <laughs> up. For sure. Uh, well, it was great being with both of you. Thanks so much for your time. Um, and you guys get to stay on because okay. everyone is coming back. Welcome to our Meet the Experts casting directors panel. We are joined today by Cam Patton from As We See It, Sky Topic from The Challenge, Margie Simkin from Star Trek Strange New Worlds, Aisha Bywaters from We Are Lady Parts, and Libby Goldstein and Junie Larry Johnson from Yellow Jackets. Thank you all for being here. Um, I want to start by asking how did each of you get into casting? Because I don't know if that's a very common or popular career path. Um, Cami, let's start with you. Wasn't that common when I started. Hopefully it's becoming more common now. It was a long time ago. Um, oddly, I was pre-med, but my sister was an actress and uh, I 
followed her around on interviews and she, and I always knew everybody that was there and she was like, Oh, you should think about casting. And my first boss was a registered nurse, Eileen Knight, who uh, it was just very interesting. We both really loved the study of medicine, but didn't really want to practice. And uh, uh, it just ended up being a natural fit. My father was a doctor. My mother was very involved in theater. Oh, pre-med to casting. That's yeah, <laughs> as you do. Um, Aisha, how about you? Um, I first got involved in casting. Well, my mum was an, an actress when I was young. She was in the Royal Shakespeare Company. We like lived in Stratford Avon for a year. So I always sort of grew up uh, around the industry. Um, <clears throat> but after I finished university, I sort of worked for a theatre company in London called The Master Theatre Company. And while I was there, I helped uh, the director cast a play and was like, uh, I just, this it suddenly all made sense. So from there, I sort of just interned for about three years with different casting directors. And then finally, someone was looking for a full-time assistant and that's how I properly got into casting. Uh, Margie, what about you? Oh, I'm the outlier. I had no idea what it was. I was working various odd jobs around and a friend of mine had been looking for kids for... Um, oddly to play the younger versions of, of kids in a, in a movie. And she really wanted to be a writer. And so she called me in a panic and said, go in, lie, and tell them you've been working with me. And uh, I, cause I need to take this other job and I don't wanna leave them in the lurch. And I did it. And, um, you know, like Cammy, I mean, suddenly it, it just, wait, I'm good at this. I don't really quite get what this is, but I'm good at it and and it was a different time and I actually never worked for anybody else and it's a kind of, it's I just people started trusting me and letting me do stuff and I tripped into it and very grateful. It, it sounds uh from from what I've gathered sound very like instinctual once you get into it so uh Sky what about you? Um, yeah, I started sort of as an assistant. I was an assistant for RJ Cutler and then for John Murray at Buna Murray, obviously the production company who makes the challenge. And the good thing about that was I sort of from that desk could see all the departments. So I could sort of, I'd watch all the meetings, I'd roll all the calls and I could work out like where, where makes sense for me. And it was definitely story and casting. So I've sort of managed to get myself into a position where I cast the challenge and then I run the story in the field. So that's just like a perfect mix for me because I get to choose amazing talent that I think are going to make a great show and then sort of see that through um, in the production process. But those few years I was on John Murray's desk at, you know, Murray was just the perfect place for me to like work, make money and just like watch all the departments and see like where do, what makes sense for me. I'm definitely not an editor, you know, like well, I'm not business and legal, like where, who am I? And that's sort of how I got there. Awesome. Uh, Libby, what about you? Uh, well, oh, I used to be a lawyer <laughs> and uh, I never tell anybody that. Jeannie must be dying. I know, yeah. I can't believe it. <laughs> well, cause I don't know what to say. Say, so I'm going to say the truth. So I used to be a lawyer. And then one day I was just like, you know, I don't, and I was a TV baby. I watched a lot of TV. And so I wasn't lawyering and I was hanging out. And my husband, who can't stand TV, was like, you watch so much TV. You watch so much. Why don't you just go get a job in TV? <laughs> and I said, OK, I'm going to. And I did. As, as easy as that. <laughs> it was as easy as that. Uh, Junie, were, were you also a lawyer? <laughs> no, I wasn't. When, when Libby and I started working together, uh, I did not know for five years that she had been a lawyer. <laughs> and some agent said, oh, is that Libby Goldstein who used to be a lawyer? I said, no, no, no. She, she went a lawyer. She taught for a little bit, but she wasn't a lawyer. And then Junie said to me, are you a lawyer? And I said, no. <laughs> that? So yes, that's all true. Libby didn't think anybody would hire her if they knew she was a lawyer, which is my right. Say. Yeah. Back in the <laughs> anyway, I kind of fell into it too. I had a brother who was the TV director 
and I was like his, and this is back in the day when you used to go all over the country, like on location doing stuff. And he'd do big mini series and stuff. And I was his assistant and I would always help with the local casting, like setting up these. And that really my whole in, entree into casting was doing local casting. And that's back in the day when casting directors would go on location and cast. And I was, Jackie Birch had cast a movie for my brother and she was in Florida and she needed somebody to help her. And I started helping her and she was so encouraging and thought I had great taste. And how, cause I was like, how are we gonna know if they're any good? And she goes, you'll know. And uh, that kind of started. And so from doing that type of casting which was really, really, really good um, training because you're judging people not on their resume, not on who their agent is, not on any, you're just seeing, in some of these places, you're seeing like 400 people a day because you'd go into like, you know, Jackson Hole, Wyoming and need to look at cowboys and you set this up. And sometimes out of these 400 people sessions, you'd find like 15 people. Anyway, and then from that, I wanted to get into real cat, you know, real, and I, started working, <laughs> yeah, I started working here in town and I loved it. Awesome. Um, what do you guys think is the biggest misconception about your job? Um, Margie, let's start with you. I think the biggest misconception is that we don't make choices. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw a few out here that we don't, that, that we don't make choices, and that all we do is that they don't understand how much we do that has to do with the whole. Um, in, in a weird way, it's almost like what Sky was talking about, because I think in in her world, it's so much you're almost writing the show as you're casting the show. Um, but those of us who work in scripted work are also helping to create the universe. And I think people think we just bring in five or six people and somebody else picks those people and that's the end of our job. And it's a lot of other stuff too. Mm -hmm. And creating the whole, having, okay. having the overview. I so. think also people think I've read where it's like, oh, they have the same list. They go to the same list. They use the same people. They only use their favorite agents. There's nobody I won't talk to. I don't think they understand how thorough we are, how much we approach each thing as its own animal and everything is different. And the same people don't apply. You can't possibly have a career if that's how you, you know, how you work. It's, uh, it's it definitely, uh, diff they don't really understand the full scope. I think of what we do and the fact that so much of what we do is creative and then we have to turn around and have business minds that can create a budget and make deals and know every single rule at SAG and you know it, it's there's so much to it that makes it I think way more involved and interesting than a lot of people kind of understand right yeah like like you're thinking like oh you bring people in and like the director picks like one out of the lineup okay. right? yeah um Sky what, what about you from from your end un unscripted um, yeah, I mean, just like everyone else has said here, it's much bigger than you think. It, it really is like contracts and like scheduling and then like your natural instincts. I mean, with the challenge, we really see the show as a place where the intersection of society is being shown, like how do people collaborate? Like how do they live and work together with set different sexual orientations, religions, race, gender, ethnicities? And it's really rare to see that in unscripted programming like we do on the challenge because often a lot of uh, these shows are down to the racial agenda lines. And the challenge is really a trailblazer in that regard. And these are all things like we are considering, you know, we can't just have a sea of the same looking people, a sea of the same, you know, people with the same backgrounds, you know, like it's a giant puzzle and everything sort of ticks off from um, everybody else. So. You know, obviously it's a little different to what um, most of the ladies here on this panel deal with, but we have a giant jigsaw that really has to make sense at the end. And um, all we really have is our cast, you know, without our amazing cast, like they're playing a really intense game, obviously, but they need to turn up and be the show. And that's, you know, starts and ends with, you know, our department. Yeah, and then there's like their personalities is what the fans are responding to as well. And right, like, who they actually are. You know, it's a big part of my job is like any moment that I'm like, this person's not being authentic or they're self-editing themselves and that's what they're going to do when they get out there, I'm just allergic. And, and it's sort of across for me because I'm like, 
the, the audience is too smart now. Like we can't underestimate how clever they are, how they can see through all the BS. And that is, you know, something I'm like finally tuning myself. So that at the moment I sort of sense that I'm like, okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> see you next time. Yeah. Um, uh, Aisha, what about you? I think it's the idea that like um, with actors, I, I'm on your side. I, I want you to get the job. Um, if you don't want to get, if you don't get this job, it's been really great meeting you for other things that we're working on and for other jobs. So it's always important. It's always relevant. And I'm sort of not here to judge you. I think that people might think, have, you know, Carson Jones have some kind of complex that we're going around making these decisions and think we enjoy it. It's not. It's always the material is leading who we cast, um, not a personal preference. And, and every meeting is sort of um, never a wasted opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess there, there's kind of that like stereotype or joke that like, oh, the casting director hates me because I didn't get the part or they never cast me in anything. But mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Junie, what about you? Well, uh, I guess it depends on when you say misconception about casting, if you're talking about misconception with misconception within our business or from the outside world, because my, I was going to say before Margie said hers, I was going to say the complete opposite. I, I think the misconception is, is that we have a lot of power and that it's glamorous. And number one, it's not glamorous. It's real work. It's real, real work. And I love it. But, and I think we do have power and influence and all that, but it's, is so inherently collaborative. And that changes, the degree of that changes from project to project, depending on producers, writers, studio network. But so it's a mixture of actually having a tremendous amount of influence and not ultimate power, but, but no one has ultimate power <laughs> in, the, in the creative, in, the, in a collaborative creative medium, I think. I mean, I, I, I'm not complaining about it. I think we're lucky to be in this field. No, yeah, but it, you, you all like, wait, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say it's, you know, it's kind of like what Aisha was saying that it is the material that ultimately drives it. But I think that we have, um, it, it isn't just bringing in bodies to the room, which is, no. what, which is what I feel like the outside world's idea that we're, we're somehow, you know, like HR and you're looking at the resume and it doesn't matter, you know, how good someone is if they don't have the credits. And, and that's crap because if someone's great, we don't care if they have the credits, you know, we care if they serve the role and serve the need of the project. And, and, and you'll fight for them. Sorry. And we'll fight and we'll fight like hell. And that's the other thing I think people think we say no, as uh, someone was saying that we're, you know, we're the people there crossing our arms and saying no, that's the other kind of TV version of, you know, when they do the movie, there's always a casting director with a grim look on their face sitting there saying no. And, you know, it, it's quite the opposite. You know, we're, we're in there giving people a chance, you know, having them, telling them to change their clothes so they'll look great for the thing, you know, giving them tips, giving them, you know, we, we're helping and encouraging. We want everybody to get the role because then, then we can get on to the next role, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, Libby, what about you? Um, I think, you know, nowadays there's so many people involved as opposed to, you know, 15 years ago that there's a lot of management going on. Like you're a shrink, you're, you're a lawyer, you're an accountant, you know, you wear and you're a creative person and you wear a lot of hats. And I think it, you have to wrangle people, which takes, I think it's for Junie and I, it's fun because we have each other and so you know we can be good cop bad cop whatever you know needs to be but it is a lot of um there's a lot of emotional wrangling uh to get something done these days and so there's you know management i don't think people realize you know that that how many people are involved in a decision and how long it gets takes us and it's really on us to get everyone on the same page yeah. and on the right page. Mm -hmm. exactly. um, unfortunately, we're, we have to wrap, but it was great speaking with all of you. Thank you so much for your time and have a great day, you guys. Thank you, you so too. much. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you.